Rock The Rock Pile Report. The pettiest, hardest drinking Bills podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Rock Pile Report podcast. I'm your host, Bill, season ticket holder, Drew Gear. That's my producer, Chris Krueger. And we are here with our week eight preview, the Buffalo Bills at the Seattle Seahawks. Guys, we'll run down the numbers for you real quick. The time, 4.05 p.m. The place is in, what, what is that place even called now? I feel like it's changed names. It's called Lumen Field. Lumen? Bu- Buffalo minus three, over under 47. L- that seems high. Lumen set, yeah. Field previous names, because I swear to God, it was named after. Like, okay, so Lumen Field, formerly known as Seahawks Stadium, Quest Field. Yeah, that's what I remember it as. That's what I was going to say. Like, I thought, like, Quest, Century Link. Apparently, it was yeah. that for over a decade, and I don't remember that at all. The only place, like, Chris, if you play, if your team played in a place called Century Link Stadium, you assume you would just abbreviate that to the link, right? Yeah. Except when I hear the link, the only thing I think Philadelphia. of is Philadelphia. So what do they call that place? Lincoln Financial Field, the link. I know, but I mean, like, so if you're Seattle, what do you, do you also call it that, just knowing you're wrong? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you try to. Let's see, weather... Lumen Field. Let me guess. It's going to be rainy. <laughs> I was going to say yes. <laughs> Rain. Uh, 55 degrees, uh, 60, 60 or 70% chance of rain. The over under is 47. That might be a play on the low. That might be a play on the low, especially if the weather's bad. Yeah. Plus, I don't know if Seattle can generate offense. Well, that's one of the most interesting parts about this, right? Like we get, I I guess if we're going to start this, first of all, I hate the fact that 506 Sports doesn't put out their coverage map until Wednesday. Like, what do you, like I have like the, like football zebras doesn't update their assignments. So I don't know what ref I'm going to be cursing out in my living room this week. Although that doesn't matter, Chris. I think we've established at this point. Yeah. So realistically, Taking a look at this, what's well, the line I, well, again? I have a question. What's the line again for Buffalo real quick? Three. Um, is this Josh Allen's first time? First time in Seattle? Yeah. That's a good question. Because we were there eight years ago. Has he been in the league for eight years? No, he was drafted in 2018. So this should be his first time in Seattle. The last time we played the Seattle Seahawks... I beat the fuck out of them. Well, wasn't it that 2020 game? Yeah. So we played them in 2020. That was the game where... I think we dropped 50. Well, I know that it was the game that um, AJ Klein had his coming out party because the team finally realized, hey, instead of playing him as a stand-up linebacker and trying to make him drop in coverage, let's just use him on the O-line. And he, uh, he just bullied them i remember a strip sack fumble forced on russell wilson i also remember in that game there was a play where jerry jerry hughes didn't rush the passer you know it was a fourth and goal and there you know russell wilson rolls out and is sort of like faking like he's gonna run and jerry hughes just never bites and he just face guards him like it's basketball the entire way forcing him to eventually just huck it into the end zone where Micah Hyde picks it off. I remember that. I remember the, I, and I also remember it being one of the first times we ever saw a Buffalo Bills screen pass work. They ran a tunnel screen and it went right down the middle of the field. If it wasn't for a touchdown, it was for a giant gain. And I just remember us like aggressively beating them. If you want to scroll down, Chris, what do we have for stats or a score? There's 44. 44-34. Okay, so, they're, so their offense did some punching back there down the stretch. But I remember at one point we had a pretty significant lead. And it's weird when you look at these two teams now because they still both score points, but philosophically it's so different. Like, to start off the entire thing of, you know, how to feel, because the, the whole reason we do these preview shows is it's usually me sitting on my computer pouring over the idea of how do I feel prepare myself emotionally for this game what are some things that i should probably be aware of in case i see them and i don't want to freak out chris are you manipulating the controls mid-show no no i don't even know what's on that screen that's our 
ATEM software audio control. <laughs> uh, the only thing that comes to mind for a Seahawks Bills matchup is the first time Reed Ferguson watched a football game with you. That's what I remember about these matchups. I actually told somebody that story at the tailgate this weekend. <laughs> I mentioned the fact that at the time Reed was upstairs, he was on the practice squad, so he didn't travel to uh, Seattle with the team. And so he's upstairs, you know, it's right before halftime. He's FaceTiming his girlfriend. He just got here, too. Oh, yeah. It was his it's first season first, in Buffalo. So he nice. doesn't even really know me. It all was that his well. first week back. And he's watching the game with me for the first time in his entire life. And he decides he's going to FaceTime his girlfriend. She's still in Louisiana. You know, his, his, his college girlfriend who he continued to date until he joined the team. And he's upstairs. Like, there's a full floor in between he and I. And when... Uh, what when Richard Sherman ran our kicker and make no mistake about it, Dan Carpenter, it was a dirty pool, and he ran our kicker. The the wall, like the 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 bit of profanity that left my mouth was not only so aggressive, but it was so loud that his girlfriend on FaceTime with a floor in between us was like, oh my God, what was that? Where are you? Who are these people you're associating with in Buffalo? <laughs> That's my fault. <laughs> See, Chris, you can't introduce me to nice people. It's no. not a good idea. No. So it's funny because this is, again, another team that you don't see very often. And when you don't, you know, like usually vitriol is from you know, repeated experiences playing a team. I have no animosity against the Seahawks. Do you? No. I mean, I was happy Marshawn Lynch went there and had the career that he had. Yeah. I assumed he could have been that for us if we hadn't decided that we needed three running backs. You know, you have Fred Jackson, and then you draft Marshawn Lynch in the top 10, and then you turn around and go, you know what else I need? Another top 10 running back that can't actually run the ball effectively in the NFL anywhere. Yeah, I remember C.J. Spiller, his whole M.O. was like, well, I'm going to get to the edge and get the edge. <laughs> No, you're not. No, you're not. You're this not faster fucking than any- pros. You're not faster than everybody by default, which means what you do stinks. And meanwhile, you know, everybody here was, you know, I kind of watched the deterioration of Marshawn Lynch and the media and the way that relationship fell apart, because when he got here as a rookie, he wanted to be here and uh, he didn't know anything about the place. People try to color this as, oh, Marshawn Lynch thought he was too good for Buffalo. It was actually kind of the opposite. We thought we were too good for him. And you can see it in the way that he was treated. Like, okay, so the kid made, I'm not going to gloss over this. He made some mistakes. At the same time, this team could not, like the the people who covered the team at the time could not wait to get, get a statement from him and then try to twist it and try to misconstrue it, which led to his just complete ambivalence towards the media as a whole. Most of that stems from his time in Buffalo and how he very quickly learned that there are a lot of people who work in sports journalism who don't have your back. They don't care about you as the person. They care about the job. And if by misconstruing things you say or essentially making it seem as though if you're not telling them what they want to hear, then you're somehow the bad guy that he's like, fine, I'll, I'll just not participate. I'll sour on this entire thing. And then that stuck with him. In fact, I think he talked about on a podcast after he retired, how his time in Buffalo here wasn't terrible, but the people who worked in the local media could all go to hell, which is hilarious, Chris, because yeah, I'm just here. So I don't get fined. I kind of agree. So I was happy to see Seattle succeed with Marshawn Lynch on the roster. I was excited to see that franchise do well because I like as a kid, I hated what they did with the new uniforms. I actually liked their old ones. The silver with like the Kelly green and yeah, they're the Seattle Seahawks old school logo and color design is way better than it is now. Yeah. That lime green horse shit. I mean, get the fuck out of here. I mean, look at this 2024 Seahawks. And I think they tried to do like a return to that. Didn't they? They usually do that for like almost like the color rush. Well, the color rush is like they're just neon green, but I saw that they had the old school throwbacks. That's what it is. And I think those things are sweet. 
Chris, if in post you could throw a picture of that on screen right now, guys, look at these things. The old school throwbacks from DK Metcalf in that silver helmet with the dark blue jersey. Like, that's clean. I yeah. love that. Easily one of the best uniforms in football. No idea why they went away from it other than wasn't their owner who died like part of Nike? No, you're thinking of Phil Knight with Oregon. Oh, okay. You're trying to think of <laughs> You're trying to think of Paul Allen with Microsoft. Oh okay. or Apple. Well, okay. I don't know what one he did. Well, whatever it is, they Call steered in if you know. They steered whole hog into this uniform revamp, won a Super Bowl, but then have proceeded to suck or at least be mediocre for a while. And some of it had to do with the deterioration of Russell Wilson. Some of it had to do with the decline in terms of, you know, I, I like the the move from Pete Carroll this offseason. Like, if you want to talk about who they are today, I think one of the most foundational changes was getting away from Pete Carroll. Because philosophically, what he was bringing to the table, I mean, he's still like a senior advisor. He works in the front office. But. I, I believe I don't want to say president of operations. Chris, fact check me on this. I don't even think he's with the organization. I'm pretty sure I saw that he still works for them in some capacity. Oh, he does. Senior advisor. OK, so I don't know why I thought he went back to USC for that type of role. OK, so Pete Carroll still being in the building, but giving the reins over to somebody else who's a defensive head coach, but who has maybe ideas. <laughs> We'll, we'll find out, but maybe ideas of how they could make the offense different and better, probably bring some fresh, bring fresh eyes can breathe fresh life into a franchise that was going stale. You know, they're treading water in a division with the 49ers and the Rams who have, you know, the Rams have won a Super Bowl. The 49ers have been to a pair of them in the amount of time. I think the Seahawks have like what one playoff win. Yeah. So the franchise needed a facelift. And so we're now getting to experience this coach's rookie season. And I think it, it started well enough. You know, they, they came out like gangbusters. They were three and oh, everyone's talking about how oh, the, the eight, NFC West is on notice. And then they proceeded to lose three. And then, you know, Chris, it's like anything else, right? In a vacuum, you can look at a sports team and think, you know, who and what they are. And you need about. Um, a month to a month and a half of like data before you can start trying to do trend analysis. But some of the numbers on Seattle this, this year are, they're just fascinating. Really. If you try to figure out who are, who the hell are the 2024 Seahawks? So ahead of this one, before we get into depth into too much depth, there are injuries, Chris, there are a lot of injuries ahead of this game that are going to play a huge role, Right. Seahawks injuries right now today. I know that DK Metcalf has a knee injury. Now, I don't know if he's, you know, because today's not, I don't know if it's a practice. They would kind of simulate it. They, I do know that DK Metcalf had a knee. It didn't seem like it was overly serious, but no one knows. Tariq Woolen, their starting offensive tackle who was already struggling, Stone Forsyth. He's not doing well. Trey Brown, a backup cornerback who's been forced into activity. Again, questionable. For the Bills, I think the biggest one would have to be Terrell Bernard. Oh, yeah, he was injured twice. Yeah, well, I think it's the same injury, but then one of them said it was a head injury, and then one of them was a foot injury. Like, let me see if I can go to bangedupbills.com. I'll text him. I'll text Kyle. Oh, I thought you were going to say you'll text Terrell Bernard. No, I, I can. So Mike Edwards right now is questionable. Dorian Williams left in the fourth quarter due to a knee injury, but he's considered probable to return. Curtis Samuel, he's been ruled out, which, I mean, let, let's face it. Curtis Samuel has been ruled out since like week two. <laughs> he just happens to be out there on the field. <laughs> The the Terrell Bernard injury is going to be the one worth watching. You know, Banged Up Bills has a great piece on the fact that because it's a foot injury, it there's a lot there. And it could be ankle. It could be there's a ligament in the foot that he's like, oh, they saw them working this. And I believe it's this. It seems concerning. Yeah. Enough so that I'd say it's probably, you know, I was going to save it for the end of the show, but it might be part of like one of our keys to victory is how do you fill this linebacker void against this team? You're going to have to do something. I mean, I think their injury 
sheet is worse than ours simply because one of them is Metcalf. Sure. Who I doubt he'll play. I don't you, know about that. If you that. say week to week. But I believe DK Metcalf is also a cyborg from the future. So he <laughs> might be able to play. A cyborg from knee. the future sent back in time by some really pissed off GM to make everybody in that draft class look stupid. Yeah. Every GM who participated in his draft class looks like a moron today. Dude, I would love to go back to our draft because we were doing the show, obviously. I would love to go back to the our draft shows and see who we had. We probably had Schofield on for that to talk wide receivers and reminisce and get some audio from that and uh, what everyone's pre-draft thought was on uh, Metcalf. But he's playing like he should have been in a first-round pick. Well, here's what I love. So when you look at it in the first round, there's no wide receivers being taken. And then you see Marquise Brown go to the Baltimore Ravens with the 25th pick. And then you see Nikhil Harry get drafted with the 32nd pick in the draft. I wonder what he's doing. I wonder what that guy's doing. Where did, what what grocery store is Nikhil Harry working in right now? He's probably at Ralph's. Ralph's. Now, Debo Samuel being taken ahead of him, I suppose you could try to justify that. How many other laughable ones? A.J. Brown, that's a good pick. All right. So right now, the second round, Chris, look at the wide receivers in the second round. Oh, no. Oh, oh, no, baby. What are you doing? All right. So revisionist history here. In the second round of the NFL draft, these are the wide receivers taken. With the 36th pick, Debo Samuel. With the 51st pick, A.J. Brown. With the 57th pick, J.J. Arciago whiteside who I don't even think is in the NFL anymore. No. Paris Campbell went with the 59th pick. Andy Isabella, who spent time on the Bills practice squad. I think he's still here. He was taken with the 62nd pick. And with the 64th pick in the draft, the Seahawks took D.K. Metcalf. <laughs> it was a, you know what i bet it is some guy in the future said hey i'm gonna genetically engineer a receiver send him back in time because i really really need to make a point that arizona's gm is a fat idiot <laughs> like i know the dui will f- finish him off but hey let's inject this into everybody's veins for a minute so with that said there's injuries and i think some of those are some of them are going to be really important to each team uh, the Forsyth injury, he wouldn't be playing if they had a better option to tackle. Let me put it that way. So this game basically comes down to a game of mismatches, and it's weird in terms of trying to identify who they are ahead of this game, especially when you start looking at the numbers. Like If you, if you look at their offense and just how they, they were put together. Chris, can you do me a favor and tell me where was Zach Charbonnet drafted? What draft pick did they use on him? I know that they took Kenny Walker last year in the second round. Where did they draft Zach Charbonnet? It had to have been middle. I'm very interested because this has been bouncing around in my head all day ever since I looked at these numbers. They second are, round, 52nd. Okay, so you now have two different running backs, right? Two different running backs on your roster whom you have... Like, you've invested in these guys. They're supposed to be a significant part of who and what you are. And yet, when you look at what's going on with them, it's hard to wrap your head around. Because when you think about the strength of the Buffalo Bills defense here in 2024, it's obviously our secondary and then kind of behind that's our pass rush. Which is something you would expect if you take a look at Sean McDermott's pedigree as a head coach and a talent developer and where they prioritize finding the right fit. You know, for all of us who pound the table for a hyper athletic safety, Sean McDermott prioritizes guys who he thinks are smart. He's like, I'll take brains over flat out athleticism all the time. And he thinks he has that in Cole Bishop. And yet he's still forcing him to earn his stripes. A lot of the hand wringing coming into this game seems to be about the idea that the Seahawks have all of these known running backs and the perceived lack of talent and rush defense by our front seven, especially if Terrell Bernard's not not available. You see who their sl- backup slot wide receiver is? Who? It's up on the screen. What do you got there? Let me see. LaVisca should know. <laughs> 
<laughs> Walmart <laughs> Chenault. <laughs> He is my he is my insult for every player who just comes out with like they're super physical and they've got all these intangibles. We just don't know how to use them on an NFL football field. That means you're not good. That's code for, hey, I might not be good at football. You're you're an athlete trying to play the game of football, LaVisca Chenault, and no one's been able to find a role or a home for you. <laughs> That's hilarious that he's on their team. This is what I like about this. A lot of the people who are scared about this upcoming game, it comes down to a couple things. It's DK Metcalf and it's the rush. There is something crazy happening right now, though. If you look at the team's numbers and look at how they actually run the ball and where they prioritize it, they're in the top 10 for rushing touchdowns. And if you're a lay person, you look at that and go, oh my God, they're going to barnstorm us. Chris, do you know that they're 31st in rushing attempts and 27th in rushing yards? I feel like they should be higher based on their running back depth chart. They literally only run the ball in the red zone. It's it's wild, right? And a part of me thinks it's because they leaned too far into modern NFL analytics. Because if you look at it, they currently lead the NFL in terms of passes on first down with 101. 65% of their first down plays are passes. That's okay. So you did this. Why did you invest all this money in draft capital into running backs? And you still got to pay those guys. You could have gotten fifth rounders to back up your second rounder if that's what you really wanted to do. And then it's, it's even harder to wrap your head around when, when you see like, Like when they do run, their style isn't north south, get up quickly into the field. It's so much different than what the Bills have seen playing teams who have running backs like Tony Pollard, Derrick Henry, Brees Hall, Tank Big Bigsby, got Braylon Allen, guys who get upfield quickly. Their running backs have a lot more like east and west to their game so far this season. Now, some of that could just be youth. You know, we're, we're here now in year three and you're watching James Cook. Like, it looks like he's finally got a handle on how to just, okay, pin my ears back. And even if it doesn't look like the holes there right now at this second, I need to trust that my guys are going to open a hole for me, which could be a problem, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. That dynamic in and of itself bodes well for a team like the Buffalo Bills who play a lot of nickel because they're softest between the tackles rather than to the edges of the formation. So in this way, who they are schematically, it's it's at least not as daunting. I don't want to say it favors Buffalo, but it's at least not as daunting as you might have thought otherwise. And then you start digging into some of the things when you when you go into like the people who actually study the Seahawks, who actually blog and write about them. They have that? Oh, yeah. Shockingly. Their run pass balance is terribly skewed, and it's because the coaches believe that the passing game is their strength, and they refuse to empower the run to be the thing that drives their offense. They have Ben Grubbs as an offensive coordinator. Chris, give this a goog because I don't. I again, I've listened to a couple podcasts, I've done some research, but I don't want to feel like I'm making this up. Ben Grubbs came directly from the NCAA ranks to being the offensive coordinator for the. Uh, Seahawks. True or false? Doesn't his his Wikipedia has nothing on Seahawks offensive coordinator. His Wikipedia's got nothing. Ryan Grubb. There, <laughs> there it go. is. Ryan Grubb. Ryan Grubb hired 2004 after serving for an offensive coordinator at the University of Washington for two seasons. So Kalen DeBoer, and this is where you get into that thing of making mistakes. Like Kalen DeBoer's hire in Alabama looks like a mistake now in retrospect. But we just got done talking about how uh, the core, you know, the, the head coach we just played against, Chris, who calls his own plays, Callahan. Yeah, yeah. Was an unproven play caller who just came from a really nice tree. Their offensive coordinator came from a really nice collegiate tree and then jumped directly into the NFL. And fans and people who cover the team point to that as one of the reasons that their current pass run balance is so terribly skewed because he can't wrap his head yet. 
Maybe he will. Maybe this is the week. But so far, he has not done a good job of wrapping his head around the concept that you have to balance your play calling style for the for the NFL game, because the advantages that got you by in collegiate football don't exist here in the NFL. You want to see a perfect example of that, Chris? The passing volumes, you want to talk about them not being sustainable for success? Do you remember last season when everybody lost their fucking minds because Josh Allen threw 40 passes in a game? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to hear some of Geno Smith's numbers in their losses? I want to say over 50 attempts in In all of them. In a loss to the New York Giants, Geno Smith had 40 pass attempts. In a loss to the San Francisco 49ers, he had 52 pass attempts. In a loss to the Detroit Lions, he had 56 pass attempts. I don't know. Like, I would have to do the research. How many offensive plays do get run on average in a game? Average on uh, Google it, Chris. Any average offensive plays per game NFL. 56 passes out of however many touches you get over the course of a game seems crazy to me. But it's easy to see how you get here. It says 153, so divide that by two. Okay, so divide that by two. It's like 75. Okay, so three quarters or more of your plays are all passes. And it's happening in games where you lost, but those games weren't blowouts. You know, the Detroit game got out of hand. I could see that. But maybe it got out of hand because you kept throwing the football. You gave your offense no balance. And unfortunately, well, throwing the ball is obviously where the NFL is headed because the rule book makes it more advantageous and all of the potential for big plays. Also, it's much harder to get three yards consistently throwing the ball when you compare it to running the ball. I think on just a play by play basis. They went on to lose all three of those games where they just had these ridiculous pass attempt totals. And one of the things that doesn't help them is their quarterback. Geno Smith was a great story over the last season or two. You know, he he goes to comes out of obscurity to win a job in in Seattle on a one year deal and then secures an extension for himself because he plays so well. The team was a a playoff contender that year. That's you know what? I will give you your flowers because it's a hell of a story. I mean, where was EJ Manuel on that one? Uh, EJ Manuel couldn't do it. No, <laughs> but, but Geno Smith bootstrapped himself up and got himself back into football. And between him and Baker Mayfield, they started the conversation about maybe some of these quarterbacks just need more time. And there's some merit to that. So with that said, this season He's starting to show, and maybe it's just time spent in the league. Maybe it's the things he refined in his game have gotten, I don't want to say figured out, but maybe film studies reviewed revealed some things on him. Because here's what I'm seeing. His accuracy down in the intermediate and deep portions of the field isn't helping their cause for why these high passing volume games are resulting in losses. His numbers, which we'll get into in a second here, are pretty miserable in the like five to 10 and then the 10 to 20 yard window, or at least they're not great. And that's supposed to be the area where today's NFL with two high safeties, that's where you're supposed to be able to thrive because safeties are kind of artificially giving that to you. The back of the set, you know, the seven man box that makes up the box that makes up your front seven right at the back of that is that's the sweet spot. That's where you want to be able to attack a team repeatedly if you're a really good passing attack in the NFL and Geno Smith just isn't doing it. Now there's a couple of reasons I think for that part of it's your offensive line, not giving them protection he needs. And now over the course of a season, he's developed a little bit of happy feet. Not, not as bad as JP Lawsman. Chris, you remember those days. Oh yeah, but not great. And at the same time, like evidence of this is Jackson Smith and Jigba. The way their offense was built, DK Metcalf is supposed to be your deep threat. I mean, you look at some of his numbers, it's wild, and it points to like what the problem is. DK Metcalf is second in the NFL in receiving yards right now, Chris. The only person ahead of him is J- Jamar Chase. And we know that his size makes him an incredibly difficult matchup for any cornerback. 
you have to be both technically sound and you got to bring a pair when it comes to try to cover him for an entire game because he, he will, f- it, it's a fist fight for four quarters. He's physical and he's talented. And you got to have a short memory because he's going to beat you. He will win reps and you just got to be able to forget about that one and get to the next one because if you let that one compound and you let him pushing you after the play because he likes to play that kind of game get under your skin you will unravel and that's where he makes his bones but when you talk about efficiency even his efficiency is broken he's second in yardage fourth in targets he's the but but chris he's the only wide receiver in the top five of the nfl for yardage without double digit yards per target So that means that out of all of his corollaries, he's doing like for all those targets he's getting and all the yardage he's racked up on a per target basis, he's not really delivering as often as you'd like. He only has three touchdowns, which to put that into perspective, uh, Keon Coleman is too. So it's not like this idea that he's this uber deep threat that scores long touchdowns. That's not really materializing. And what's worse is he only has 19 first downs all season, which I I took a look at it. I think like, what was it? 19 passing receiving first downs puts you like lower six, like lower sixties, higher, like lower fifties. I think someone fact check guys call in. If you call in, if you have the, the number on that, but 19 first downs for a talent like him is wild. And then it's the success percentage statistic that I kind of like. All it does is it take it removes all the context and just says a play that gains 40% of the yardage necessary for a new set of first downs on first down, 60% on second down, and converts the down on third or fourth. Those are considered successful plays. His success percentage, he ranks 98th in the NFL which puts him behind Shakir Coleman and Kincaid. So you're never going to take a look at those statistics and say, well, ah, Derek, 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 Derek Metcalf's a bum. Instead, what you do is you take a look at that. And you take a look at these other offensive efficiency metrics and you say, there's something broken about this passing attack that they're trying to make up for with volume. And it's working. They're one of the top passing offenses in the entire NFL while simultaneously being one of the worst rushing attacks. They'll run it well when they steer into it. But the problem is, is that as soon as you put even a little bit of scoreboard pressure on them, their offensive coordinator can't help himself. He just can't help himself. and <laughs> He just steers directly back into the pass. And that's a problem. It's a problem, especially if you're playing a team like the Buffalo Bills. And that dynamic would seem to play directly into our hands, wouldn't it? Yeah. In that way, I'm I'm just thinking about this. For the Buffalo Bills, I get it. Like, if you look like I love the people. So so there's NFL. Well, what is it? NFL. N-F-E-L-O app.com. It allows you to make your own fancy graphs with the line dots and EPA per play on an X-axis. With another thing on the one. And what I love is that when you run the Seahawks through any combination of these things, they are smack in the middle of it. No matter what you change, <laughs> they, are, they are a mediocre, mediocre team. But in the NFL, that's okay. You being an, an, a mediocre team is not a bad thing. It means that for as many warts as you have, you do some things well. What they do well, Chris, is that Lockett still, for being as old as he is, has a great feel for where to be on the field. He's built a great rapport. He's got that veteran savviness. Well, especially when he's faced with zone, which is something we play a lot of. And so in that way, he kind of, because of Jackson Smith's and Jigba, just kind of his lack of chemistry right now with Geno Smith, Lockett's doing all the underneath work. Him and some guy named Jake Bobo, which you, Bobo, that's just an unfortunate last name. Like... There's no one who ever had the last name Bobo. Like, Chris, what if you sat down for your first day of your first day of chemistry and they go, all right, everybody, open up your books. Mr. Bobo is here to teach you, you know, about <laughs> how to measure the molarity of and you would look at each other and just have a moment of like Bobo is going to teach me that. <laughs> I don't know if I buy that. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I think the same things about heavy Southern draws. Sorry to any of our listeners who have that like classic Southern twang. 
you could tell me you're an astrophysicist, but if you have like a like a boomhauer thing going on, I can't. <laughs> I can't see you having an IQ over 100. That's a personal thing. I'm a bad person. So the rest of this thing on offense, it's just so interesting to me because I like Chris, the answers are right in front of them, right? Like you went out and started three and oh, and then went oh and three before winning in Atlanta this past week. You went to overtime with the Patriots. You got boat raced by the Lions and you somehow lost to the Giants when they didn't have Malik neighbors. And it's like, okay, so for all of your passing, there are a lot of times when the NFL game requires something else. When you have to go out there and try to move the ball another way, if only for if only for clock reasons, you do not want to keep having incomplete passes that allow the other team to go out there and operate. Because if I go and I look at Geno Smith's numbers, Geno Smith pro football reference. In fact, can you pull it up for me since you get the keyboard? Because throwing the ball that often on first downs, throwing it you know, 56 times a game, if you do not have one of the league's highest completion percentages every single week, you're asking for trouble. So right here in 2024, his completion percentage is 68.5, which is good, but I don't think it's good enough to make it your entire existence. It can't be the thing that powers your entire offense. You eventually have to find balance. Now, maybe this is the week they start, but I don't know. I don't know that to buy it. And then if you switch gears and you look at the defense, one of the worst fourth quarter scoring defenses in the NFL. Chris, do you think maybe part of that is because they throw the ball a lot, which means their defense absorbs more snaps, which means by the end of games, they, probably they might get a little gassed. That sounds that sounds right. That sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Yep. Okay. They've played some of the worst. They've played some of the worst offenses in football. This is almost the opposite argument that was made about the Tennessee Titans heading into this game. You know, people were saying statistics. Oh, you got to throw them out about the Titans because they're the number one offense, but they played all these just garbage football teams. Okay. They played the New York Giants, who are currently ranked 30th in the NFL in offense, and they were missing Malik neighbors. They gave up 29 points and lost the game. They played Miami, ranked 32nd in the NFL in offense. They gave up three points, and they won because Skylar Thompson is bad, and that offense is broken. Good for them, though. They handled business. They played Denver, who is the 21st offense. They gave up 20 points in a victory. They played Atlanta, who's 15th. They held them to 14. They played Detroit, who's third in the NFL. They gave up 42 points and got embarrassed in a laugher. Because they played a team with a strong offense, a good quarterback, decent play caller, well, good play caller for Ben Johnson, and a quarterback who's decent, a quarterback who is playing probably the best football of his entire career. The Buffalo Bills are the fifth ranked offense in football. The track record for that defense doesn't seem great, and that's before you take the injuries into consideration. Yep. And the weather. And the weather. They need the weather on their side. Now, they do have some things working in their favor on defense. That defensive line is going to be a real stumbling block for Buffalo. When you take a look at the makeup, Jaron Reed, Byron Murphy, and Leonard Williams are just a 3-4 defensive structure. Huge 300-plus pound bodies on the inside who are all veterans who have proven over the course of their career that they can devour space, and they rotate frequently to keep everyone fresh. And then they've got this rotation on the outside of uh, Boye Mafi, Derek Hall, and Draymond Jones. It's crazy the production that these guys are putting together. 11 sacks, 70 pressures over seven games from three players who all rotate. That's pretty impressive. And it's kind of a testament to how good the interior defensive line is. Now, the linebackers behind them not exactly yeah uh, they're not exactly anything special i mean when you take a look at it chris former buffalo bill tyrell dodson oh he's over there tyrell dodson and former dolphin jerome baker two players that we and josh allen both have a lot of familiarity with 
they're not slouches, but they're not player like they're players that their own teams who cultivated them decided that they weren't going to be worth their impending salary and decided to cut bait. They're average. They're not liabilities, but they're limited. And I think if anybody knew how to exploit that, Chris, it's probably, I don't know, the guy who practiced every day last season for the last couple years with that guy. And also the guy who played him multiple times a year over the course of his entire career so far and just absolutely abused the Dolphins defense in the process. Mm -hmm. I think that what they have is a really strong D line followed up by a kind of weak linebacking core weeks weeks mean they exist <laughs> they're okay and again mediocre is okay like if i'm if i'm a seahawks fan after learning everything i've learned about them in the last 72 hours mediocre is okay because there's a lot of bad in the nfl i mean look at the browns look at the panthers there is a lot the patriots right now there's a lot of bad football in the nfl they are not a bad football team they're mediocre That shows up when you look at their secondary, their second cornerback Witherspoon. He's very gettable. I mean, he's got 141 yards after the catch allowed as a boundary corner. That's not great. Their safeties, their safeties are allowing a lot. Like I take a look at this, Chris, and then you look at some of the losses. And that's what I dug into is the statistics. And where did it happen? Where did it go wrong for them against San Francisco? Their safeties, love and Jenkins. Combined for more than 70 yards after the catch allowed, 156 total yards in all three touchdowns. And the the worst part is it didn't take anybody having a monster game. Like, it's not like, oh, my God, Brock Purdy threw it all over the field on him. You know what it was? It was just Debo and Kittle. Two guys who I know when I say just, everyone will roll their eyes and go, oh, my God, they're superstars. Sure. But also, if you only have two guys who are seeing the majority of your targets for an entire football game, you should be able to you should be able to stop that. The fact that we have a much more multifaceted approach that should, in theory, test the depth of that, the, the, depth, the depth of their secondary. That should be cause for concern if you're a Seahawks fan. I think that's a matchup that absolutely favors Buffalo. Now you go to the New York Giants game. The Giants didn't have their best wide receiver. They have Slayton, who Darius Slayton's not a slouch, but he's nothing special. He's certainly not being paid like he's special. And I don't think his career, anyone would say, oh, my God, I'll give up a pick at the deadline for Slayton because the Giants are in trouble. But they give up 122 yards for him when he was one of the only threats on the field. And that's in a game where they only had one pass to a running back all day. So it wasn't anywhere in their game plan for the Giants to throw around to like tertiary targets let's involve the running backs and that guy still worked that secondary i think when you look at our group of pass catchers this is a matchup that on paper looks a lot stiffer than it will be or at least should be and so in that way i feel pretty good about a lot of these things chris i mean as i'm sitting here talking how do you how do you feel about it and how do you feel about this in general just coming into this matchup i think it's I think it'll be a close game because of the travel. You're going all the way out west. Weather's definitely going to be a factor. Weather will be a factor. And to your point there, it's interesting now that I've laid it out, though, isn't it? When you hear that here's a team where the weather might not favor us throwing the ball all around the yard. But we have this dude named Ray Davis and this other guy named James Cook. Well, you have a team that like, hey, we can run the ball. So this is it. We go, hey, we've already seen this movie. You know, we've just said, hey, let's let the running attack keep us in ball games while we figure out how to win it through the air. Meanwhile, the Seahawks have just between the 20s are nah, nah, (laughs) we don't need it. This is the danger of making yourself a one dimensional football team. Sometimes the just the elements say no. The elements play a role and decide that you're not allowed to do this thing that you've decided to make your identity or at least not going to do it at the level that you thought you were going to be able to do it. It's going to add a degree of difficulty you don't need. If this is the week that they really choose to stray from everything that Ryan Grubb, their offensive coordinator, has put like put out there now, then I 
feel differently about this. But as long as they do what they've done for six straight weeks, which is remain married to a pass heavy ideology, it's going to be tough. And so that is like that is going to be one of the sticking points of the game. And I think the way you get them there and it's going to become one of our keys to the game tonight, Chris, it's going to be scoreboard pressure. And in fact, why don't we just open up the segment right now? Here's your keys to victory. Wow, it's a lot of keys. Bigger the keychain, more powerful the man. Scoreboard pressure is going to be paramount in this one because I don't think Ryan Grubb can help himself. I think that in a game where he probably should steer directly into the run, although their offensive line isn't great, Chris, and that's and maybe that bears some of the culpability in this. You know, I'm not going to try to excuse them. I mean, they have been poor. Are they better pass blockers than run blockers? No, and that's the well. Here's the thing: at the onset of the season, do you remember when we had Ken? Ken Kusick on the show, and he talked about how the Ravens' offensive line got beat up in that Chiefs game. Yeah. And then they got beat up in that Raiders game. And then they figured out, hey, you know what will actually make us better is if we stop asking our guys to do more pass protecting than run blocking, because at least now they're not exposed. The Seahawks need to do that badly. Stone Forsyth is not a good tackle. He hasn't had a good season. Their interior offensive line has been worse. Their tackles and when you look at the interior offensive line have allowed a ton of pressure on Geno Smith, a lot of ill-timed pressure, and that's the worst part of it. It's not just the sheer numbers, it's the timing of them. And so that leads to some of Geno Smith's skittishness. It leads to some of these things where you as an offensive coordinator go, maybe I have to throw the ball because I don't trust my line to execute the run blocking well enough. I mean, Chris, you could argue that's why the 2020 Bills were the way that they were, right? Yeah, we couldn't run block well enough. We had to pass the ball. With that said, I I have a really hard time wrapping my head around this. And I think that with a little scoreboard pressure, we can force Grubb directly back into these bad habits of his when it comes to how he skews the run in the pass volume. And if we do that, we move them away from what what will probably be their highest percentage play of the afternoon. So I think it's going to be a lot on Josh Allen and it's going to be a lot on the offense to help this defense by taking the Seahawks out farther and farther away from the one thing they want to do well, which is put your heads down, run between the tackles, especially if we're missing Terrell Bernard hit us in places where we just have a talent deficiency. It, it, it doesn't so much matter. You know, it's just schematically we're not designed to defend interior run especially missing talent coming into a game like this. They would do well to focus on it. But if you can put a little pressure on them, I could see this offensive coordinator panicking and deciding that pass heavy is the way to go to do that. The offense is going to have to bring like they're going to have to bring the raid game. I specifically mean the interior offensive line, the pass rushers on the Seahawks team. They're legitimate. They, they are very talented and they're deep. So they can rotate, they can move guys around the formation, they can roll out some really exotic packages. I mean, I've seen it, I've seen it just in clips of them being able to put all three pass rushers on the field, kind of like we were doing when Von Miller wasn't suspended. You know, the the plays of Groot, Epinesa, Von Miller, and Ed Oliver in that Miami Dolphins game. They can do that because of the quality of their defensive line. The, my real fear isn't that pressure off the edge because I think our tackles are having really good seasons. And I also just trust Josh to be able to feel that and react. The problem is going to be is that while they're getting that edge pressure, you need to maintain the integrity of a pocket. You have to be able to give him some place to escape to or to get away from because this is what it's going to take in order to deliver the type of passing attack that like when you go back and watch that Lions game. They gave Jared Goff time. I think his his average time to throw was above league average, and the result was they put up 42 points because the secondary of that Seahawks team is gettable. Do you trust Connor McGovern, Mike Edwards, and Torrance to have a complete game and bring their lunchboxes? Because, like I said, Jaron Reed... Former Alabama player, no joke. He was taken early. He's maintained a steady career of just being a never. A, he's not a sack artist. He's not a penetrator. He's just a bully. 
And so is Leonard Williams. He's cut from the same cloth. Torrance and Edwards are kind of in for it, don't you think? Yeah. Let's not let them be the weak link that tanks our offense. And also, it's going to come down to it's going to come down to Joe, Joe Brady. Joe Brady's going to have to figure out this off. I think it's outside zone runs and play action because I don't trust the instincts of Jerome Baker and I don't trust Tyrell Dodson. And it just I think that they would you would do well to give them eye candy in that way to kind of freeze them because I don't know that athletically either one of them has the speed or the the ability to recover. You know, people talk about that being the elite thing about guys like Terrell Bernard, Matt Milano, the recovery speed to, oh, I got fooled off the snap and I took a step in the wrong direction, but I'm so good I can get back and still cover my route. There's a reason Dodson and Jerome Baker were made available. It's because they don't do those things well. But in order to get that type of impact and work the middle of the field the way you're going to need to so that you can then open things up and have downfield passing to Dalton Kincaid and to get the sideline, you're going to have to run the ball. And in order to do that, I think running head first behind, I mean, no, no offense to Torrance and no offense to Edwards or McGovern. I don't want to see us running head first into Jaron Reed and uh, (laughs) Leonard Williams. I think that's a fucking mistake. I think you focus on the outside zone run, get them moving east and west, make that your game plan, run to space, you know, Shanahan style, get out there, run to space and let these guys, Davis has shown he's got a little wiggle, he's got some power, Cook, obviously that's his bread and butter, let's get them into places out of 11 personnel where, you know, out of shotgun, you can let them run, let them see what's in front of them. I think that's going to be probably the way you set this offense up for success in this game. Under over, Chris, Keon Coleman. Do you want to say this is a because Amari Cooper, right? Everyone talked about how he's wide receiver one coming into the game. And then his presence opens up Keon Coleman for his first 100 yard game. Who do you think has more yards if the Bills execute their offense appropriately? Who do you think has more yards? Cooper, Cooper or Coleman? Amari Cooper. You think this is the game where he's finally comfortable enough that he puts it all together? Probably. I'm not going to lie. I have a feeling this is one of those games where Amari Cooper is going to he scored a touchdown. They've been playing th- you know they've been playing clips on FS1, ESPN. Amari Cooper touchdown in his first game with the Buffalo Bills. Ah, oh, he only had one drop and it was this and it was that. You don't think that the defensive coordinator is not paying attention to that? No, he is. So do who? where would you gamble if you're a coordinator? Would you roll your defense to favor, hey, I can't let Amari Cooper have a big game? Yeah. And maybe give Keon Coleman some of these softer zone, because they don't play man very often. You know, the days of the Legion of Boom are over. The, the Seahawks today play a heavy zone concept. And again, that's the departure, right? That's what happens when you get rid of a Pete Carroll and you bring in a new head coach who has a new defensive philosophy. You've got guys who were maybe a little bit better suited to playing man now trying to play zone. And so maybe that in and as we're talking through this, maybe that's part of the reason that this kind of works to other teams advantages when they're throwing the football. But regardless, I don't know. I think I'd like Keon Coleman to have more yards than Amari Cooper in this one. All right. Would you like to wager a Seagram's on it? No. We haven't done one all season. Come on. I got to get you in here on something. No, this is not the time or the place. I got to feel 100% confident on it, and I don't. See, but that makes me happy because that shows you, like, look, we have Khalil Shakir, who, by the way, guys, leading the NFL in catch percentage. <laughs> leading the NFL in catch. In fact, not just leading, leading the NFL in catch percentage. I bookmarked a tweet earlier because somebody put it out. They really ran it down here. I'm looking at Khalil Shakir. Yeah. Khalil Shakir. Okay. He's leading the league in EPA per target through seven weeks. He's ahead of guys like Jamar Chase. (laughs) His own, you know, who else is in that conversation though, Chris, when you talk about EPA per target, DK Metcalf. Khalil Shakir is leading the NFL. Arthur Brown, never heard of him. Nope. Okay. Rashad Bateman. Never heard of him. Never heard of him. Why? Because he doesn't get targets. 
Jamar Chase. Cole Komet. Do you know who's just down there? Who's that? Keon Coleman. <laughs> nice. I think this is a game where the Bills, despite the optics, have enough weapons on offense that if properly orchestrated, and again, that's going to require outside zone runs, can't get, you can't try to, you know, this whole thing, we're going to impose our will on the defensive line. Don't do that. Because I'll tell you what, I've tried imposing my will on a number of things. Those of you who listen to the recap show, you probably, the Steve Jensen story. Yeah, you can try to do that all you want. You'll just end up in the pricker bushes, which if that's where you want to be, keep it up. I think that we have the talent to orchestrate an offensive approach that allows us to take advantage of their lack of depth and just their deficiencies as a defense that's soft at the linebacker level in terms of coverage. I think we're going to be fine. I don't even want to try to make a score prediction on this one, Chris, other than do you think the Bills will cover? Like, do you think like, yeah, I think they should win. By three. Win by three? Oh, yeah. All right. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out, guys. I'm excited for this because this win is super important. You play this game. Then you play Miami. Then who? Indianapolis. And then who? Kansas City. You have a chance to play some teams that all have warts, some of them glaring. Kansas City. And roll into that Kansas City game on a heater. They have warts. Pacheco and the guy that speeds. Wouldn't it be nice, Chris, to hit this thing on a heater? Yes. (laughs) Oh, if they win this one, Chris, we're going to come in next week and open the show with pennant fever. Mm. (laughs) Or do we have to wait? Uh, I can't wait. I'm just saying for copyright reasons that wouldn't be uh, allowed on y'all tube we'll figure it out guys i'm excited about this game i'm also not excited about it being 405 405 is just a weird time isn't it no because they've always done games at 405 i know but 405 like time of day for a bills game sorry that's what happens when you go west <laughs> or you're a prime time team because when Kansas City comes here, it's a 425 game. Just once, I'd like to see us be able to go or a, some East Coast team be able to go out West and have it be a 1 p.m. kickoff. <laughs> Just a 1 p.m. Eastern Standard kickoff. Fuck you, Left Coast. <laughs> you hear that, Super Mexican? Yeah. Eric? Yeah, I said it. You guys, the Left Coast sucks. <laughs> I hope the Bills can prove it this week. Chris, this has been fun, but we got to get the hell out of here. I'm Drew Gear. That's Chris Krueger. And this has been your Week 8 Preview.